So far we've been talking about carbon isotope ratios that you would measure at the whole leaf level and the models to predict the isotope ratio at the whole leaf level. But there are carbon isotope variations among tissues and let's spend a few minutes talking about those. Isotope ratio variations at the subcellular level exist and they reflect secondary fractionation events. But it's important to keep in mind that isotope balance must be preserved. If some components or molecules are enriched in 13C, then others must be depleted in 13C. There are very predictable intraplant variations in carbon isotope ratio, such as shown here in the table or the graphic on the left. If zero is the value that's predicted by the models, then some, some components such as lignin and lipids, are actually depleted relative to the average value in the leaf, whereas pectins and hemicellulose or cellulose are enriched relative to the whole leaf. This is very predictable based on knowing the biochemistry, which you might learn from the Merck chart, but we won't have time to go into that today. It's important to recognize that as you sample through the height of a tree, in this case there's a beech tree, that the leaf lamina shows a variation in pattern. We'll describe the basis of that variation in the next section, but you'll also see that the cellulose shows a similar variation. In general, if people are interested in tree rings or in cellulose, a rule of thumb is that cellulose is about two per mil enriched in 13C relative to the leaf. John Roden will say more about that in his lecture on tree rings. Guideline number eight. These isotope ratio variations exist at the subcellular level and they reflect secondary fractionation events. Isotope mass balance must be preserved. It's important to appreciate that different leaf compounds have different turnover rates within leaves. So there's that variation associated with uh, subcellular fractionations, but some compounds, if you're looking at them, have low turnover rates and others have high turnover rates. So if you're trying to understand a process or to reconstruct some aspect of metabolism or climate, molecules with low turnover rates, such as cellulose, waxes, and nucleic acids are useful biomarkers. John Roden will talk about cellulose as a biomarker and Kate Freeman will talk about waxes and nucleic acids. Other components have a very high turnover rate measured in hours to days such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and sugars. These would not be good parameters for understanding long-term changes in metabolism or climate because they'll turn over in the period of hours to days. So how can we see a variation in the respired CO2? How could it be enriched at some times and depleted in the other, at other times? Let's consider the molecule of CO2, of glucose. And here you find in this six carbon model uh, molecule, the two carbons in the middle are 13C enriched. The basis for that has to do with the carboxylation. When you break that glucose down to pyruvate, and pyruvate dehydrogenase releases that CO2, that CO2 is enriched. That gives you the impression that there's a fractionation. But no, it is only that a certain part of the molecule uh, has been respired. When pyruvate is uh, decarboxylated to uh, acetyl-CoA, that is the basis for the Krebs cycle and for lipid formation. Lipids tend to be depleted because the enriched carbons have been metabolized. So short-term variations in these metabolic fluxes may induce variation in the isotope ratio of dark respiration. Is the molecule being only partially metabolized or fully metabolized? 
So at equilibrium, what comes into a system, whether it's a cell or an organism or an ecosystem, as a flux should be balanced by what's leaving at equilibrium. If not, then we would expect the carbon isotope ratio of the stock to change over time, and we tend not to see that. So time scale patterns might give you the impression that the system is not at equilibrium. Wang Wei Lin performed a very interesting experiment <clears throat> where he took bean cells and these cells were ground up and he fed them a C4 sugar or a C3 sugar and they looked to see what the isotope ratio of CO2 coming off that cellular respiration was. And what he saw was whether you looked at 24, 48, or 72 hour time intervals, that the isotope ratio of the flux was the same as the isotope ratio of the food source, indicating that there is no fractionation during metabolism.